Okay, hello world. Hello everyone. Um, my name is uh, Sian and I run a YouTube channel called Studio Decentral and I have this little thinky co-working co-living community called uh, blockchain co-working co-living community called Nans over in Korea. And uh, I am here today because we are embarking on a new journey and we're starting this new show with uh, <laughs> two surprise guests. Guys, please uh, introduce yourselves. Sure. Uh, all right, I'll start. Uh, my name is Koji Higashi. Um, I've been involved in the Bitcoin crypto space since 2014, a few years now. Um, I've done a lot of media, media related stuff, including my own YouTube show in Japan. It's, it's in Japanese. But uh, yeah, I'm good friends with both Bobby and Seon. So wanted to do something together and talk about what's happening in Asia in general, crypto space in Asia. Yep. All right. So my turn now. Hi, everyone. My name is Bobby. I'm the co-founder of CoinGecko. So CoinGecko is a crypto data aggregator. So we track crypto price, market cap, trading volume, uh, developer stats, social media stats from uh, 4,000 coins from over 300 exchanges. Uh, I got into the Bitcoin space in 2013 and started running CoinGecko from 2014. So CoinGecko is close to five years old right now. It's been a long time. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Holy crap, you're <laughs> half as old as Bitcoin. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, things move a lot. Yeah. <laughs> I remember CoinGecko in beta. <laughs> At the uh, time, the US was not very Polish, but I was like, well, that was one of the first websites I used as well, actually. So, yeah, I think we stayed in beta for many years until we finally decided, okay, I think it's time we take off the beta tech. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. It was I in beta for a while. I, I didn't, I think the inspiration came from uh, Gmail. Like Gmail took, uh, had the beta tech for a very long time before they took it off. Oh, so you're going to become like the Google of decentralization. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> yeah, I hope hopefully. so. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so before, like, yeah, so we're, we're starting the show. And I think, Koji, it was, since it was your idea to kind of do the show, can you kind of like tell the audience what the goals of the show, why, why we're doing this in the first place? Sure. Sure. So one of the reasons is that I get a lot of, I see a lot of people on Twitter and outside Japan saying like, oh, Japan's very progressive and their regulation of crypto is very good, etc. Uh, but in my opinion, that's not really the case. And there's a lot of issues surrounding uh, regulation and what's happening in Japan now. Uh, and Japan's presence, like Japan was more had better presence in 2017 in terms of trading volume, etc. But nowadays, it doesn't really have the presence it used to have. And, and you know, it has other issues as well, including taxes and uh, slow development, etc. So I wanted to talk about that. So kind of clear up misconceptions that people have about Japan. And also wanted to ask questions about what's happening in Korea to see them. And you know, Bobby can also talk about market in general and maybe Malaysia and may maybe in Singapore as well. So I thought it would be cool if we focus on this Asian markets in general and crypto in Asia. I don't yeah. see any other people doing that. Maybe they are. Yeah. Then hopefully we'll, in the future, we'll get more and more people from Asia. And so we'll have a room full of like 40 people <laughs> all yeah, on yeah. this. Oh. I have some good friends from Hong Kong and, you know, some other countries in Asia as well. So we, we can invite them maybe and ask them what, what's happening in, you know, in their country or, you know, what kind of projects are there and stuff like that. Yep. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Surprisingly, it's, well, not, not surprisingly, it's very hard to get information because, you know, Bitcoin used to be a thing where like only English speakers used to do it right and then now it's gotten to the point where each country is, faces its own regulation problems and each country has its own projects and there's different obstacles that are you know we're trying to create the internet of money but surprisingly there's a lot of offline stuff that happens in different countries that need to be coordinated and for us to like communicate and understand each other better i thought that was kind of the goal that we were going yeah, towards exactly and i just wanted to have a fun conversation i just want to make it you know fun and like you know I started off my YouTube show because it was kind of fun and I started off with my friend and, you know, same spirit. Let's see. Let's see how it goes. <laughs> All right, let's start. So, 
How, how should we start? Uh, I have a bunch of questions for Sion actually about Korea. Okay. Yeah, let's start off with the Bitham news. Ah, uh, sure. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm sure you guys heard, but Bitham's laying about laying off about half of its employees. Um, uh, but the thing is, this isn't specific to Bitham. First of all. So this is actually happening across exchanges in Korea. There's been a lot of smaller exchanges that's obviously been shut down. But even Corbett, they've been they've been in the process of laying about like laying off about thirty to forty percent of their employees. Um, that that was like, from what I understand, it was a management's management's fault. But this bit dumb thing is it's it's actually been ongoing for a couple of months because when I met with friends like friends of mine who work at bit dumb, they've all been saying like. You know, in Asia, they don't tell you like you're fired. They recommend that you go find something else to do. <laughs> so that's just been happening the whole time. And uh, I think many people, I mean, were surprised with the numbers that were presented, right? So why why do they only have 300 employees? And actually, the Bitham Bitham actually owns a whole building, so I I'm sure it's much more than 300. And they've had several customer service locations around Korea. But a lot of those customer service locations are now shut down. Um, so that's kind of like what's going on on the ground here. Uh, is it because of the bear market, basically? So. Yeah, yeah, it's because of the bear market uh, for sure. But yeah. uh, one thing is, so what these exchanges are doing is they're also trying to create other services. Um, so Bitthumb has a whole bunch of service, like suite of services that they're creating. I'm mm -hmm. sure you guys saw like the STO stuff. They're kind of interested in security tokens. They're mm -hmm. also trying to separate out. They have a, they have a um, organization called Pickthumb that they separated it out, which is so Bitthumb. Like Kickstarter? Bitthumb, yeah. Bitthumb oh, is the okay. one that, Bitthumb is the one that lists. And, and then Pickthumb is the people that have the authority to, uh, do, do, to do due diligence before it, they list. So these are separate legal entities. There's no holding company on the top or anything like that. Okay. So they're trying to do this thing to make it more like institution friendly, finance friendly. And other, other services like payment services, et cetera, et cetera, hoping that those will give them some sort of cash flow other than what they've been doing with transaction fees from exchanges. But Bitham still has a lot of lot of trading volume. It's like number one or two in terms of trading volume, right? Yeah, but it was, you have to remember that trading volume is nothing compared to what they used to have. Okay, right. So when they were racking up the operation costs, right, as they were expanding, right. Just, if you think about customer service people, like that's not like having like four or five offices across Korea with. With, with like tens with tens of uh, customer service agents, that's no, that's not a small operation. Yeah. yeah, but I mean it's the same in Japan. But a lot of, I mean, excluding minor exchanges, a lot of major exchanges in Japan seem to be doing fine. You know, they're not going bankrupt. Uh, so I don't know what the difference is between Japanese exchanges and Korean exchanges because Japanese exchanges trading volume is even less than the Korean. Uh, exchanges so but I think maybe it has to do something with the fact that uh, we don't know if this volume is actually uh, real legit or is wash trading right sure yeah. so yeah is it legit <laughs> is it not <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I think for Korea like I mean the exchanges are not regulated so the, uh, I mean Japanese exchanges are regulated so they can't really do all these sort of things but in Korea right. I think it's like less regulated and I think there's a lot more exchanges in Korea than in Japan um, we, I mean at CoinGecko we keep seeing a lot and a lot a lot of new exchanges coming out from Korea so yeah. maybe Siyun can, can share some light I mean besides uh, Itam and all these new exchanges yeah. in Korea yeah I think that's like people think it's just an easy business to get into or there's this thought that like if you are gonna do anything related to blockchain, the first business you need, you need to do is an exchange because that'll bring that constant flow of cash and then you can go off and do something else. Right. So what used to be centralized has actually dissipated a lot um, with, uh, and it, obviously each of these exchanges have different strategies. They all have their own tokens. They all have their transfer mining um, algorithms and pretty much every, every, I think many of the traders in Korea, they're not really loyal to a single exchange. 
So whatever um, exchange is pumping, they go there and they pump the hell out of whatever is happening there. So that's just what that's just what I've seen. Okay. What do you mean? What do you mean the the Korean traders are not uh, lawyer? Meaning they 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 want to go to an exchange where there's an exchange based token that can pump in price, and they want to move over to that to the exchange. Yeah, yeah. So if uh, so. The trans mining exchange thing is interesting, right? Because it's like the ICO for exchanges. Um, you know, oh, right. ICOs were used in order to bootstrap projects, right? And now trans fee mining is used to bootstrap exchanges, like younger exchanges. And so um, if there's a better deal on the other side of town, then, the, you know, like opening up a bank account isn't that isn't that difficult. So they'll do that and then they'll eat the, uh, uh, they'll, they'll, um, make some gains and then they'll just exit from that. They'll switch that all into crypto or Korean one and then pull out and then go to another place and repeat. Mm-hmm. I've actually heard, oh, sorry, sorry. I've actually heard that there are groups that are specifically focused, at least in Korea, specifically focused on um, just going after trans fee mining exchanges. And okay. So trans fee mining exchanges are common in Korea. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'll, Oh, and just one more thing, and this I know this gets into like the like the dark side of like legal things, but okay, there's still a lot of scams. There's still quite a oh, lot of scams, yeah. and yeah. so what these scams used to do was they used to hire like developers from developing countries that were relatively cheap, and then they would ask them to build out these exchange engines, right? But you know, you build out this exchange, this exchange engine only to have it like sputter and fail. <laughs> so what they do is even if they are, um, even if they're, they have a complete scam coin, they're trying to buy some like white label exchange engine and mm. they're trying to launch it that way. So mm. I've seen, I've seen um, that those kind of actions throughout the months too. Um, how does exchanges or maybe exchanges don't care, but the government tried to fight against scams. So that's interesting what's happening in Korea. A uh, lot of things like that don't happen in Japan because of regulation. You cannot really add scam coins to licensed exchanges in Japan anymore. And you cannot even do uh, trade mining because it's, it's still kind of a new thing. So the government, the Japanese government still cannot really figure it out. So it's not okay for Japanese exchanges to issue their own token and do transfer mining and stuff like that. So um, is there any countermeasure for scams or, because I see a lot of Korean exchanges list just so many coins. Yeah. Compared to Japanese exchanges who can list only like, you know, maybe 10 or up to like 15 coins max because Mm -hmm there's a white list of coins that exchanges need, need to appear to in Japan. Yeah, so I think in order to understand this, you have to understand um, there's two type of exchanges in Korea. I'll say like there's the official exchanges and there's the unofficial exchanges. So like the official exchanges, what they have is there's these things called virtual accounts in Korea. So Korea is one of those countries where you could pretty much open up a um, like you could you could open up a crypto account a, a, an account at an exchange in about five to ten minutes, but you could do it very quickly. But the way it happens is there, each major bank is able to issue virtual accounts, right? So virtual bank accounts within within their bank that allows crypto traders to like have their like to put in their care W and then to pull out, right? But the thing is. A lot of these new, newly uh, new exchanges, the unofficial exchanges, what they're doing is they just use their company bank account. So without having virtual account for every single customer, they just use one company bank account. And then what people will do is they'll put their KRW into this bank account and then they'll reflect it back onto the database. Mm. Okay. So a lot of these scams and whatever are all using this, the second method that I was talking about. All the major exchanges um, with the virtual bank accounts and stuff, whether it be privacy, uh, whether it be people, people being insured, like all of, all of those things are guaranteed, but um, it's the second type that, that's really popping up. And um, in terms of regu- regulation um, and the government crackdown, they've just recently started going after scams. Okay. But 
honestly, it's so hard. It's so hard to go after. I mean, they just started, so they're they're like completely new to this too. Right. It's like a cat and mouse game, right? The government goes after one, ten more comes out, and then you're always trying to play yeah. catch up. Yeah, yeah. And honestly, like there are so many more important issues in crypto. Like scams aren't the only important thing, right? But I remember, like, if you know, if if there are uh, shining beacons of light, like these crypto are like legit stuff, then people will be attracted to that. But right now, with the bear market, people don't really know what they should be investing in or what they shouldn't be investing in. So that mm-hmm. I think that's they're just uh, interested to make a quick buck. True. I mean, even Coinbase seems to be adding a lot of coins nowadays like very aggressive yeah i i'm quite surprised to, to see that coinbase uh, adding a lot of these small yeah. coins these days it almost seems like uh i mean binance added a lot of coins and coinbase feels that they have to add more to kind of compete against uh binance these days otherwise binance is going to run away with the crown right yeah true yeah. agreed um uh, is it uh, uh, Siyun, is, is, is ICO legal these days in Korea? At one point, I remember regulators wanted to ban all ICOs in Korea. And then I think they made a U-turn on it at some point. Oh, well, yeah. Like a couple of years ago. I remember. Yeah. Yeah. ICOs. I need to check. But what they did, what, what the law exactly did was actually it put ICOs under crowdfunding. You have to understand mm-hmm. that's what the law did. So there was a maximum cap that you could make with crowdfunding, but mm-hmm. they increased this maximum cap, right? Okay. So that people are incentivized to crowdfund and use this legal framework that existed instead of going off and doing ICOs. Okay. And even now, like, you know, I honestly, I can't tell if ICOs are legal anymore because there hasn't been an ICO <laughs> for a long time. <laughs> I haven't, yeah, the I haven't heard of Market's really solved. It's pretty much dead, the ICO market. Like. Yeah, but I, if I think of like projects like Terra, they have they had their public ICO, but the ICO wasn't open to the Korean public. So, mm, you know, better, better safe than sorry. People are just not touching it with the 10-foot pole. Um, oh, just, just, just one more thing. Um, with the exchanges thing, I, what I've noticed is, I don't know if you guys noticed this, but have, has... Um, the relationship between exchanges and tokens like kind of changed over the over the past couple of months. Meaning, like a long time ago, it was the it was the coins that were knocking on the doors of the exchanges, wanting to get listed. But nowadays, it feels like it's changed, where the exchanges are going after coins <laughs> that are pumping and then asking them to be on. What do you, is it just in Korea or is it the same everywhere else? Uh, different in Japan uh, because of regulation. Uh, ex- <laughs> I mean, uh, it's the same. The exchanges want to add more coins desperately to in order to compete against other exchanges or other global exchanges like Binance, right? Mm. Because, for example, uh, EOS is very popular globally and it has decent trading volume, right? But in Japan, none of the Japanese exchanges can add EOS yet. So people, if Japanese users want to trade EOS, they have to go to Binance and other exchanges, right? So yeah, exchanges are the ones who definitely want to add coins, but the process is very difficult in Japan. It's, it's not easy. You have to submit a like, list of criteria, what this coin's about, etc. And nobody knows yet what the process is like and how they evaluate each coin, etc. So. Um, I, I'm going to add to that. To that, um, I think there's two kinds. Uh, so it depends on what sort of exchanges. Uh, those big exchanges, if you are Binance or one of the big exchanges, I guess the coins will still knock on your door. But if you are a small exchange, like there's no reason for a coin to knock on your door, you probably would want to go out, out and try to acquire the coins to be on your platform, because uh, liquidity begets liquidity, right? And it's hard to go against the big uh, exchanges because they will get all the liquidity. If you're a small exchange, like, so it's a question of how do you differentiate yourself? How do you grow? So I think it, I mean, at the moment, like a lot of exchanges are charging coins to get listed and some of them have a ridiculously high uh, listing fees up to six figures or so. Um, I don't think that's really sustainable in the long run. Um, in fact, with so many new exchanges being created and as we can see in Korea, it actually makes sense if you were, I, I would go as far as to say that it probably makes sense for exchanges to pay coins to get listed on their exchange because right. if you are the first exchange or the second exchange to be listed yeah. to list that coin, 
you get to get all the coins community members to trade on your exchange and then you get to make yeah. money from the transaction fees yeah. that you make. So instead of charging coins to get listed on your exchange, you should probably pay the coin teams to come and get listed on your exchange. Yeah. That's yeah, but, <laughs> but the thing is they, they're not going to say that, right? That's not a viable <laughs> business model. Yeah. So what you would say instead is, hey, we thought your project was pretty cool. Here's like a discount. We'll give you, yeah. at, we'll yeah. list you at a discounted yeah. rate. Yeah. Um, but but this this kind of goes back to another thing. Like you're talking about Binance, but even Binance is the same with this launch pad, don't you think? Like Binance has to seek out projects that are going to drive more users to Binance. And so it's projects that have a strong user base. I know they were trying to reach out to some projects in Korea um, that had a strong, like a unique user base and they wanted to onboard all those users to come to Binance and trade. It just yeah. seems that, it just seems that the day of, exchanges just endlessly getting new inflow of users is over and they need to figure out some creative ways to onboard new users. Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, it's always a good idea to have a high quality launch pad, do an initial exchange offering, get uh, more new users onboarded. I think, I think what a lot of these exchanges are trying to recreate is to recreate the golden days of ICO from one, one or one and a half year ago and try to create FOMO in the market. I think what Binance is doing with Launchpad is, uh, is, is great. Um, so they keep their quality very high and then it, 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 it moves on from there. But I think it will be interesting to see all the other exchanges are trying to do their own Launchpad at this point in time. It will be interesting to see what the others are doing in the next couple of months. But I mean, from observation, there's two kinds of exchanges. Some exchanges are uh, just doing the Launchpad to get like what you said, uh, high quality projects to onboard new users. Uh, I think some exchanges are looking at it the other way around. They just want to have Launchpad and IEO just to get more money from listing fees. So, yeah, <laughs> short so, term is good, but long term, I don't know. <laughs> so yeah. I, I've, see, I've seen the craziest stuff being done on Korean exchanges. What okay. I've, one of the things I saw was a saft of a saft. So, saft, saft. <laughs> yeah, so what they did was there's a saft that's obviously given to a particular fund or individual right yeah. and this guy signs an nda with the smaller exchange to trade portions of that saft on that exchange and so the project is absolutely furious right they're asking this exchange to shut down it's basically an iou of an iou they're asking <laughs> this, this these guys to shut it down but then from the point of the exchange it's like hey, we're offering this new product that's not sold on the market. Even if it's an IOU out of an IOU, it's still, we can still promise that these people are going to end up with these tokens. So what's the problem? So there's all these like weird things that are happening. Mm. It almost sounds like you're describing Cosmos. <laughs> <laughs> because Cosmos just got started trading and like, technically all those tokens yeah, are not tradable yet. Yeah. Cosmos it's, is, it's funny like all these uh, Cosmos tokens being traded yeah. uh, it's very traded a lot in Korean exchanges um, it's funny. already? yeah yeah uh, I mean it's all these IOU for Cosmos is mostly on Korean exchanges except for Bitforex which is trading at around $12 whereas the Korean exchanges are trading around $6-7 yeah I think um, the Cosmos though like as like I think the trading action is really hilarious. And like the fact that they're trading IOUs is really funny. But it, at least in Korea, the Cosmos ecosystem it's it's pretty it's pretty strong, and people mm. have been people have been really looking forward to it. There's about um, there's all these different players. I think I think we'll be we might be involved in it in some way in terms of like SDK education or something. But uh, there's there's all these projects, and each each player knows their role and. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, been, it's been in the making for how long? So you better be ready. <laughs> you better have learned from all the mistakes of all the previous communities that came before. Yeah, I think the Cosmos token was, they did ICO about a year and a half ago, I think. And then this, and I mean, the tokens are still not tradable. I mean, they're not, I mean, they're not transferable. They're, the IUs are tradable right now, but it's been a long time waiting for all the ICO holders. They can't even liquidate their coins if they want to and lock in the profits. Um, Pretty funny, like all the Cosmos guys in the Telegram group saying like, oh, these tokens are not, they're not tradable yet. These are all IOUs. We have, our tokens are not tradable yet. And all these yeah. people are going around trading all this IO, uh, Cosmos IOU already. Yeah, because their mainland launch, I believe, is like the 29th of March or something. Mm -hmm. oh. oh, but it's very soon. Yep, yep. Okay. What, what other coins are popular in Korea? Because I wanted to ask you, 
uh, say this is a trading volume of Bitcoin, and why is Dash so popular in Korea or a Bitcoin? Bro, I I don't I don't even know. <laughs> or Monero, but, you know, like well, you know Monero, right? You know, okay, well, okay. So Monero, you should understand that Bitcoin is the only major exchange that's listed Monero. And about ninety nine percent of all Monero volume comes out from Bitum, anyways. Oh, really? Uh, yeah. If, if you go check, uh, go ch go check. Go it check out. Monero and exchanges. Yeah. Really? Yeah. There aren't there aren't major exchanges. Uh, that's people. true. Uh, Korean ones. Yeah. yeah like number one. Gemini. So so the reason this is the whole regulation issue, right? Mm -hmm. Because Monero has uh, anonymity by default. And so, what, what law-abiding exchange would list Monero? Right. Be thumb. <laughs> yeah. So that was that was like kind of a shape that that happened before. Like I don't know if they would do it if they're given the chance now. Yeah. But now, if you are gonna list some sort of uh, coin with privacy features, then you need right. to kind of like like figure out what you're gonna do with the regulators. So, but by the way, in Japan, uh, basically all those privacy coins are banned. Not not really banned, but the government didn't explicitly say uh, those are the reasons. But uh, CoinCheck before uh, used to list Dash, Monero, and Zcash, I think, and all of them got removed from the Yeah. So wow. it's basically the reason because it's very hard to track and uh, do accounting for those coins and you know the exchanges don't want to be responsible for that as well so uh no no privacy coins in japan probably it's gonna stay the case for a while besides bitum listing um, privacy coins are there other exchanges in korea listing privacy coins no there no. are some i think there might be some with zcash but yeah. but even then like they are like you know like zuko is visiting korea uh, for the economy, right? On April, I think he's gonna try to talk with a lot of exchanges over here. Mm. What's Populous? And there, there are some coins I have never even heard of. Wax? <laughs> yeah, Wax. And so the, another thing that's happening in Korea is actually in regards to crypto games. So mm. that um, engine, Wax, all, engine. Of those are, all of those are game related things, right? So I see, I see. Oh, in wow. Korea, a lot of game developers have started looking into blockchain. I think we're going to try to take the crypto game narrative in Korea. Um, and a lot of these guys are actually building on EOS. Interesting. Uh, yeah. So EOS, I think the reason they use it is because of the developer experience. And one of the things I'm realizing is, you know, people don't, like the decentralization thing. I mean, I think we're, we're all like, we've been in the scene all of us have been in the scene long enough where we like Bitcoin and like the decentralization that it offers. Mm -hmm. But I think these new people that are coming in, they just want to create something that offers them like very easy um, developer experience and they can like query and it just feels like an SQL or something that they've used before. So I'm seeing all of these guys just flock over to EOS regardless of whether there is blockchain bloat in EOS mm -hmm. or whether yeah. the 21 BPs like are you know whether they collude or not not collude okay. so that's just something that's happening so engine was one of the tokens and this this is just kind of gonna connect but engine is another one of those tokens that were listed on the samsung s10 oh yeah right right right, right. yeah and then engines price just shot up like like crazy this past couple months couple weeks or something right yeah, all of the coins or the projects that were listed on Samsung S10 like shot up. So Engine, <laughs> I'm sure you guys heard of like Cosmo Cosmo Coin. Cosmo, Cosmo. Oh yes, yes, I remember. Uh, What's Cosmo uh, Coin? Cosmetic one, right? The cosmetic coin from Korea. Yeah. yeah. I remember one day in the office. Uh, <laughs> I think about one and a half week ago or so on Friday, and then we start seeing why is there so much interest in this Cosmos coin? <laughs> like I remember reading a. But I, I remember um, this deal was being passed around like six months ago and then I, I, I saw it's a cosmetic coin. Like I don't know anything about cosmetics. Like, I <laughs> Are we yeah. not supposed to ask why we need coin for cosmetics or? It's, that, it's those loyalty points, man. <laughs> okay. Okay. I mean, well, Samsung supports it. So 
must be must be a bit, you know good legit. <laughs> I don't. I don't. I think. I think the people over at Engine. I think the people over at Cosmos. I think the some of those guys that are listed on the Samsung S10. They they must have like god level business developers. <laughs> I want to hire those business developers because I don't know how they got on there, but they. Wait, wait. They, it's it's called Cos Cosma Cosma Cosmo. Cos- Cosmo. Yeah. Cosmo. Cosmo? Okay. Cosmo. That kind of. That kind of you know. Cosmo coins. C O S M. Thing funny. In Japan, before the literacy was so low that uh, so ogre's coin name is uh, rep, Red. so R E P, right? Uh-huh. Ripple, Ripple's X R P, but some people consider like R R I P, right? And when the there's good news about Ripple came out, uh, ogre price <laughs> for some reason went up. <laughs> oh, so it's people are different though, that, Ripple and ogre. Rep, yeah, exactly. Rep is like a Ripple coin, right? So that was kind of the level of understanding before, but may, maybe some people are back <laughs> because it sounds like Cosmos or something. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm sure, I, no, I think I think it's the reverse. I think people are it's buying Cosmos because it sounds like Cosmo. Really? Oh my god! Oh, I don't know. I don't know. That's it might be that, that's more likely. <laughs> In my opinion, that's much more likely. Don't you that's think? so funny. That's so funny. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, um, it's all traded on the Korean exchanges as well. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I guess it's possible that people get confused: Cosmo coin and Cosmos. Cosmos. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Either way, you're going to the moon. It's possible. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think, and you know, this this position that these companies are taking. Um, and in yesterday or today, there was another announcement by Kakao Talk. So people, mm-hmm. for people that know don't know, Kakao is basically a messenger that about like ninety eight percent, ninety nine percent of all Koreans use, and they have uh, a company, a subsidiary company called Ground Ground X that was developing a blockchain called Clayton. So Clayton recently, uh, like Kakao, the, the relationship between Kakao and GroundX has has kind of been weird. But I guess now, re- now with Samsung signaling um, that they want to create, basically they want to be a DApp store, right? They want to be the uh, similar to Google App Store or Apple Apple Store. They want to be the DApp store, and they want to bless these uh, different coins as they get listed on their DApp store. And uh, so Kakao. Has made a move to, to they they said they would have a cryptocurrency wallet, and then also LG is looking into uh, onboarding a cryptocurrency wallet on their next uh, next uh, f- uh, suite of uh, smartphones. So that's kind of just some of the things that is happening here. I, I think it's a very interesting dynamics now because if you look at the crypto space, like maybe six months ago, like a lot of people were very interested to create crypto wallets. So you have people like the Trust Wallet, and then you have uh, the the Coinbase wallet. Um, I mean, Binance has acquired Trust, and then Coinbase has acquired uh, this 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 coin now now known as Coinbase wallet. And then now we see there's a lot of guys doing wallets as well, IM token and all uh, status. Uh, but what you don't re- what what we see is that I mean, the hardware guys are actually coming in on board to create wallets. The software browser the browser guys are coming to create wallets. So if you look at Opera, they already have a wallet and they have their own app stores. You see yep. Samsung having their own wallets and their app store. You see LG coming in with their wallets and app store. Man, this is so interesting because the small guys, like the small wallet developers are going to have to compete against the big hardware manufacturers, the big browser browser operators. It's going to be really interesting trying to see how these guys compete and see where they can find a niche within this space. Yeah. Definitely. And then, and yeah. then for, the, for the big guys, the, their user acquisition cost is basically zero. Right. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Because it comes pre-installed with a phone, right? Yeah, it does. <laughs> Yeah, I but know. At, the, at the same time, I've seen uh, Exodus from HTC, like first blockchain phone, right? And they have their own wallet, you know, pre-installed, etc. But the wallet, I tried it out a little bit, uh, but it was not very good, to be quite honest. So I don't know if people actually use the, you know, pre-installed wallet versus it's easy to install I'm token or whatever, you know, other wallets from App Store. So. Uh, personally, uh, yeah, I mean, some, something like Samsung and LG definitely has advantages, but doesn't really mean they, they will definitely win. Because, yeah, the, the blockchain, the first blockchain phone to me was not really very good because it was just a crypto kitty and their wallet installed. The wallet was not very good. <laughs> and 
uh, they, they can store a private key in their, you know, safe, secure environment and stuff. But uh, that, that's about it. And you can do most of the stuff without having a blockchain phone, right? Yeah, so that, that, that kind of leads to like another question I have, which is actually about hardware wallets. Mm-hmm. So with the slew of these phones coming out, like Samsung with their Knox, it's just like a, it's like a trusted execution environment, right? Mm-hmm. It's like secure, secure enclave where you can mm-hmm. run cryptocurrency and stuff. Um, with them, um, what do you think is going to happen to companies like Trezor or Ledger? Yeah. Or, yeah. I mean, and, and the whole idea of like being sovereign over your own money. I think there will always be a space for Trezor and Ledger. I mean, a phone is still a phone. You run a lot of things on that phone. I mean, there's always a way, I don't know, maybe there's, you still do feel as secure. I mean, even though it's an isolated environment, I mean, some people may still be paranoid and it could penetrate. I'm not so sure, but I think, I think there will always be a single use case uh, for Ledger and Trezor, I think, in this, in this space. Um, but I guess, I guess the question is for who, right? It depends, I mean, if you're storing like a small amount of crypto, like, I mean, less than uh, 500, 100 or $500, I guess a phone works well because it's convenient enough. You don't have to carry an extra device on, 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 on your review. But I guess if you're storing large amount, then like uh, a hardware wallet might be useful. Uh, but if you're storing super large amount, then you need like more secure solutions to cut off those private keys and store them in cold storage across several locations in the world. Um, I guess a good similarity could, you can take and compare like a camera, like, I mean, those days people, a DSLR versus a handphone camera, right? Like if you mm-hmm. just need a camera to point and shoot and take some, info, uh, some picture of a day-to-day activity, like a phone will normally work, but if you need like super high resolution image, you still need a DSLR. So I guess that may be a good analogy to compare. Yeah, but I, I just wonder about like, the reason I ask about like the target audience is this kind of let's let's talk about institutional investors as well so custodian services are like the hot thing everybody wants to launch their own custodian service and you can imagine like if i'm if i am a buyer at a hedge fund xyz why in the world would i store my own uh, private keep hold my own private keys why in the hell would i um have it on like trezor or ledger and feel secure about it right it's just They've never done anything like that before. They much rather have a custodian hold it than trade uh, trade their Bitcoin that way. So I think depending on the needs of the target audience, like that's that's where that's where the hardware wallet thing is coming from because it's for, for early adopters. I think hardware wallets yeah. are a great choice. Um, but then, I I agree with Bobby uh, in general that uh, yeah, Trezor and Ledger won't go away. Uh, they all first of all they have their they have now different services as well. Ledger is doing their own custodial service as well for professional traders like that. And the second thing is um, casual users. Uh, well, first of all, they probably won't buy uh, blockchain phones, and maybe it will be the de facto like standard in in the future. But at the same time, I don't feel comfortable like saving you know keeping my life saving amount. On a Samsung phone, although I understand it's technically like secure, right? Because if someone asks me, or like you know, beat me up and like, hey, just <laughs> you know, just open up the phone and you know, send me your coins, and I'll be I'll be scared about that as well. So I'm you know, having a separate device probably will have some kind of niche at least, uh, and a lot of users probably just keep their coins on exchanges. It's another thing, right? So even if Samsung just releases something very secure, it doesn't really mean people will just go buy it, is my, my opinion, probably. Yes, this, yeah, I just, yeah, so another thing about Korea is I don't think people care about decentralization. No, 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 no. Same, same in Japan, right? Same in Japan. Yeah. People, people don't care. People uh, leave most of their coins on exchanges, right? They never move their coins on chain. Well, many of them, at least. Yeah, I think most people just care about making money, right? How can I make more money? Right. Which coin? <laughs> which coin next? Yeah. yeah, but I think I think I think what Samsung and, and LG is doing uh, with putting a wallet into each phone, I think is very interesting because if you look into the future and imagine like every single phone, not a special blockchain phone, but every single phone that comes that is shipped to the world comes with a blockchain, a crypto wallet pre-installed. That would be very interesting. It's kind of like saying like every phone that gets shipped comes with a browser pre-installed. Right. Mm. Like, 
And then like that wallet that comes pre-installed is like your decentralized app browser that you can use to browse all the different apps in the decentralized world. I think it will be very interesting. It will increase adoption like a lot. Um, then it was when you have to see like how how to get people to use because you still need to acquire your first uh, crypt, uh Bitcoin or Ethereum or EOS right. or Tron to before you can start using any of these steps. Uh, but I think I think that time when uh most phone manufacturers come ship uh shipping their phones with a wallet, I think you will you will see it sooner rather than later, and you will be yeah, very yeah, interesting. I, I I agree. I agree, and I also maybe it's. Could be maybe two years or maybe more distant future, but I'm kind of expecting phones come with like a Bitcoin full node pre-installed or something. Holy a lightning shit. node, right? And you can lightning actually node. Lightning start, earn, start earning some micro fees by playing games or whatever. And that, that type of integration would be very, very exciting and interesting to me. But like just wallet pre-installed is not really good enough for me. Like if, if it's a full node pre-installed, that, that's a completely different game. In my opinion. I, I think this also speaks a lot about the user experience because, it, I mean, if you say like what Bitcoin application has the best user experience as of now, I think it's Cash App, you know, that Jack Dorsey, Jack Dorsey created, right? Because yeah. number one on the app store. And like the funny thing is it's not a Bitcoin, it's not meant for Bitcoin in the first place, but like he just happens to have that feature in there. Mm-hmm. And that through that, it just onboards so, so many people. Um, and so, yeah, kind of kind of like what you said, it's like, Un, like a lot of these onboarding has to happen by default. Like people shouldn't know that they're using something decentralized or they're using something that's really difficult to, for them to access. A lot of this, this stuff just comes shipped with it. And they use it just like any other app that they've always used. Agreed. But I think, I think the, I think the f- crypto wallets in the phone, I don't, I don't know what that means for regulation because that really does mean people are just going to carry a whole bunch of money with them borderless. What are you going to do at the TSA, right? Are you going to make them take out their phone and are you going to check their crypto wallet? Nah. <laughs> Is there any incident in Korea that like some, I don't know, rich traders or something like get kidnapped and get their coins stolen or something? Seems to me it happens in Russia all the time. So I'm <laughs> scary stuff, but. Oh, but this world is a scary place, man. It wasn't, it, well, it wasn't about a crypto trader, mm-hmm. but recently what happened on the news is uh, there was a super, super famous scammer in Korea and this guy liquidated all his assets and he moved overseas. But after he liquidates, what he does is he shoots out all his money to different people. Mm-hmm. And I think he gave it to his parents because like he could receive it as an inheritance from his parents, which makes it like some form of money laundering and stuff. But then his parents were found murdered. What? Very recently. So this is, this is tied in with identity, right? Oh the whole God. reason behind like, people being able to like, kidnap others and stuff is because you think your digital identity is safe when it's right. actually not. That is yeah. scary, man. That's, yeah, that's, whether, that's scary. Yeah. You know, whether it be a bank account or whether it be a yeah. money in bank account or money, like crypto that you're holding by yourself. Like, you you got to be careful with the OPSEC stuff. Okay, so let's talk to, let's move to different topics, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Any other questions for each other or something? Something that we haven't talked about yet. It's been really fun for me. A uh, lot of questions and interesting conversations. I want to I wanna ask about, so we could talk about other countries now, right? <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, ask I want to, yeah, I want to ask about like, just what's happening in regulation in other countries. Sure. Uh, I'll, I'll talk about Japan. I mean, I've already touched on it a little bit, but uh, in Japan, there's a, in, at least in my opinion, I mean, there, some people disagree, but in my opinion, regulation in Japan is not very uh, crypto friendly per se, because, because of the whitelist system that we have. So we exchanges cannot add new coins that easily. Uh, The other is ICOs are mm, practically banned, no ICOs. Uh, If you are doing an ICO, it's kind of considered as uh, STO, basically, so securities. At least that's my understanding, right? So no adding new coins. Well, not not no, but difficult to add new coins. So less freedom for exchanges. And then after 
two major exchange hacks in Japan, CoinCheck and Zaif, uh, the regulation and enforcement of regulation became much, much more strict. So exchanges in Japan are now more like banks rather than like, you know, technology driven crypto uh, companies. So uh, kind of old, old timer, old OG Bitcoiners and OG crypto exchange founders got kind of kicked out and they, because their exchange got hacked or they didn't uh, comply to the KYC ML regulation and stuff like that. So the landscape in Japan is becoming more and more like of the regular finance industry to me. Uh, so that's one. So in, in that sense, it's not very progressive. Uh, the other is tax rate in Japan is very, very unfavorable for traders. So max tax rate in Japan is 55%. So that's way Wait, too much. crypto is 55%? Max, right. Holy shit. That's one of the reasons I don't actively trade in Japan. That's it's just, high. <laughs> it's really high, right? It just, you know, it feels stupid. I mean, if I win, I have to pay like half of it. <laughs> if I lose, you know, I, I get nothing. So You can't get tax losses, credits that you need. <laughs> <laughs> so tax is kind of bad. And, you know, there are some people who are working on it and trying to lower the tax rate because obviously it's not going to be sustainable. Um, the other thing is, oh yeah, uh, payment processing. So this is also related to how tax works in Japan in, for crypto. But if you make a Bitcoin transaction, Bitcoin payment, for example, technically you have to record everything, all the transactions you made for Bitcoin transactions and calculate what was the price you bought this Bitcoin and, you know, the price of uh, Bitcoin when you made a payment and then report it to the you know, tax authority, basically. So it, it sucks. It basically kills the, pay, you know, Bitcoin as a payment use case. So a lot of stuff like that, uh, to me, Japan's not really, didn't do a very good job protecting the industry, in my opinion, at least. Any other questions? Yeah. It's funny how you say all these things because I always thought that um, Japan is one of the most progressive ones, like you mentioned. Like a lot of people uh, view Japan as one of the most progressive jurisdictions. I guess it comes to the fact that Japan was one of the first countries to put in place uh, exchange regulation. Right. And everyone else, I mean, when China banned crypto, uh, Japan came out with exchange regulation. Everyone thought Japan is pretty progressive, but I guess it's pretty tough to operate in Japan. Yeah, progressive because we are the first one, right? <laughs> so I don't know why Japan didn't wait because usually Japan's more conservative and didn't want to regulate, didn't want to be the first one to regulate new things, right? Just wait and see what other countries do. But for crypto, for some reason, Japan was like the first one. So now we're kind of paying the price and everybody else is kind of watching what's happening in Japan and see how they should treat ICOs or how they should regulate uh, crypto in general. For example, say when Bitcoin forks, because of the whitelist criteria, you exchanges cannot add Bitcoin SV, for example, because it's technically an altcoin, new coin, right? Forked off mm -hmm. from Bitcoin Cash, and it's not listed on the whitelist. So exchanges now, users kind of demand, hey, we, where, where is our coin basically, but exchanges are not allowed to give out uh, fork coins and stuff like that. So regulation's not really suitable for what's happening in the space now because it's, it's been two years now, two year old, the regulation, the law itself is two years old and uh, landscape, technology and landscape of this industry is changing quickly, but you know, so it kind of sucks. So I think, and what, what do you think, Koji? Do you think there's also like a macroeconomic factor to why Japan moves so quickly to pass regulation? This is, the, this is dealing with like negative interest right. rates? Um, po possible, but I don't think so. It was more about, uh, at the time, there were just too many scams rampant in Japan and government needed to do something about it, is my belief at least. My, my hypothesis is this, tell, tell me if I'm wrong. So yeah. Mount, Mount Gox was operational in Japan and then it went, it failed, it went bankrupt in 2014. So the Japanese lawmakers had to do something about it from 2014. So they were not sure what to do for 2014, 2015, 2016. Right. And they decided, okay, finally we have three, two, two, two to three years to, ex, 
to study what Bitcoin is about and then like, okay, let's finally regulate action. So a situation like Mongolf doesn't happen again. Uh, that's, that's my hypothesis. Uh, actually, that's a, that's a very good point, and that's, that might be actually right. Uh, and Mt. Gox happened in Japan, took place in Japan in 2013 to 2014, right? Yep. And that basically killed the Bitcoin's reputation in Japan, and uh, regulators lost their faith, basically. Well, well, at the time, Bitcoin was unknown to most Japanese people. But, so maybe a regulator, a lawmaker was thinking, okay, we cannot screw this up anymore. We have to protect customers and we have to have like right regulation for exchanges, right? Maybe that was the thinking. And then they, they tried to do it. And after regulation was enacted, actually major hacks happened after that. So yeah. the regulator really lost their face again. And like and now they're trying to just clamp on everything. And exchanges need to report everything to the regulator. Can we do this? Can we not do that? So right now it's, it's very, very strict. I mean, the other, the other point of view to look at is that other, I mean, Japan regulators had uh, a head start to start learning about Bitcoin from 2014, 2015, whereas other regulators only started looking actively from 2017 onwards. So they're still studying how to put in place regulations, whereas Japan had already been drafting regulations from 2015 and 2016. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Maybe. <laughs> maybe. So yeah, it, it, it's, oh, okay, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, considering the regulation, it doesn't seem to me they had a very good understanding of how Bitcoin works or how, you know, cryptocurrencies more in general work. So, I mean, but, I mean you can't really fault the regulators because things move really quickly. If you think yeah, about yeah. Uh, Bitcoin forks, there wasn't really a fork in the crypto space until 2017 or so. We had the first fork, I, first major fork was the Ethereum, Ethereum Classic fork. Right. And then we have the Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash fork. And then like, I think in 2018, 20, then we have like a dozen other forks from Bitcoin. Right. But before that, like it wasn't really popular. Like forks were not a common thing. And then exchanges didn't really have to deal with forks if you think about it from 2016 or so. Yeah, I totally agree. Uh, it's a very difficult task. I don't, I wouldn't want to be a regulator myself. You know, I don't know how, what would be the right regulation, right? It's very difficult and things change so quickly. But uh, seems to me they just rushed things a little bit for Japan this time and because of that uh, there's a lot of restrictions and uh, not a lot of freedom for crypto exchanges and other businesses unfortunately so that that's my take on that on the situation it's my observation that in terms of restrictiveness China and Japan actually took the exact same stance right <laughs> so shutting everything down or put it making sure everything stops and then you slowly see if you can soften things you know uh, yeah, but China's case, China, Chinese government can soften things up. Uh, well, maybe not as they wish, but they can do it quickly. You know, but yeah, they fluctuate like this. Right? Yeah, ban of exactly. exchanges is lifted. You know, it's okay now, right? But in Japan, it, if they want to change the law, it takes a long time, right? It takes a long time to change the law now. So maybe it takes a few years. So, you know, may, may, to me, they made a bad move in terms of regulation, unfortunately. But, in, but that's just Japan, my opinion, right? They did right points as well. Like, not too many ICO scams in Japan anymore. Uh, no, not a lot of scam coins they sit on exchanges because they, they can't, they have to report to that authority. So, there, there are some good things, of course, but it's, it's not like it's the best regulation in the world that it's very progressive. In Japan, they, they started forming a self-regulatory body among the exchanges, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yes. <laughs> Wanna know about it? It's just kind of political. Um, there were, we had like two major industry associations, uh, two different groups, basically. And they're like, I, I, I don't know if I'm supposed to say this, they're like kind of fighting against each other. They're like hating on each other. This mm. Things happen, right? And recently, finally, they just got united or they just, you know, uh, turned into like one united organization or association or whatever. Uh, and they help the regulator uh, determine which coins can be added or not and stuff like that. Recently, they also released data for uh, spot trading volume for each coin or stuff like that. So they're doing some good job recently. So now we know like we have about 50% of uh, market share for Bitcoin 40% for XRP in Japan, which is quite high. 
and stuff like that. So they, they are playing their role, but it, it was kind of messy before. Now they're like starting to be functional, finally. Yeah, it's, it's funny that you bring up these self-regulatory -regula bodies or these associations, because we, we see something similar in Korea too. Like basically at the end of the day, all these guys are, or at least when they're all like, they're all fighting against each other and they all have their interest. Yeah. There's like the miners with the miners, yeah. miners association and the exchange yeah. association. I know. The startup blockchain startups association and they all have uh, different agendas that they want to push. Yep. But my, I guess my question here is um, for like other, like uh, I know like Sokoji, you talked about it, but like are there lobbyists and NGOs in other countries? Other countries? Like, Right. Yeah. Bobby, are there, are there any in where, where you guys are at? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it's the same, not just in Korea or Japan. Like, um, all, all these countries, we have some sort of a fintech association or blockchain association. Right. And these guys are all trying to steer regulation in a certain direction to, right. to make it more, uh, more, more, more bet, bet, to make it better for, for, the, for the industry to operate. Uh, I, I know in Singapore there was there's two big uh, regulation two two big uh, bodies. One is Access, uh, and then the other one is FinTech Singapore FinTech Association. Yeah, so all these guys uh, they're trying to look, why why there's two associations I don't know as well. Uh, uh, but yeah, uh, everyone's trying. It's the same for Malaysia as well. There's uh, Access Malaysia, and then all trying to 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 lobby to get some regulations done in a certain way, of course. <laughs> My, my, I guess my question is, are these lobbying groups or these NG associations who lobby or NGOs, are they useful? Uh, uh, that's a good question. So in Japan's case, those associations are made up of mostly exchanges. That's why regulation, you know, turned up a way like that. Like uh, the regulation in Japan assumes all the crypto businesses in Japan are mostly exchanges. Right, so that's why the regulation. So if we are doing anything, so for example, if we want to do a Dex decentralized exchange project in Japan, and you you build a wallet and Dex built in in that, right? You have to get a same license as other exchanges because you're uh, oh, providing, providing an interface to trading, right? Mm -hmm. So that's one of the reasons is because the lobbying uh, group was mostly made up of exchanges right so of course they're like trying to protect their own interests and like you know all bitcoin or crypto is kind of like this and this is how they trade on exchanges so it's all about trading and exchanges right so i, I think that's what happened in japan partly but again yeah. i'm not uh, the lawmaker too much because it's difficult to listen to everybody yeah, yeah. i just wonder i would just wonder if there's like a different way to go about it Meaning, um, so, you know, there's Coin Center in the U.S., which does a pretty good job of uniting. Oh, Coin, Coin Center is great. They, yeah, they yeah, have they, articles and, yeah. But what, I, what I'm so impressed by them is how much they can get all these different um, interest groups, like, under them and supporting them. If you go yeah. look at their about page, there's, like, VCs, exchanges, payment service providers. Uh, there's, like, law, like, people in academia dealing with law, like, political science. There are, there are just a, a lot of different projects, like independent blockchain projects. And then these, there's, they've set out like five policies that are very neutral, that everybody, in some ways, it, that, that um, affects everybody across the board. And I'm just thinking like, why doesn't that happen? And at least in Korea, that's not happening, right? No. It's, 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 it's a specific interest. Right, 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 right. My, my guess is that um, the exchanges are the one that have the biggest to win or the biggest to lose because uh, they make the most money from any of these transactions. So, I mean, joint, forming these uh, regulatory bodies is not free. I mean, it costs money. And uh, the exchanges are the ones that have money to fund these organizations and all. And they have the most... And all these different exchanges want to be part of uh, this group so that they can go talk to the, to the government. Best if you are a, 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 a DAX or a wallet operator, you probably don't have as much cloud or funding to go and... and, and and, 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 and talk to the regulators. Again I'm, I'm, again, I'm not so sure if I'm correct, but I guess in the US, maybe these guys, I don't, I don't know, form a body earlier on and, and manage to yeah. manage to put the sep different interests aside for the betterment of the industry. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. And it all comes down to 
money, I guess. They, they, you need some money to just start more neutral NGO. And if we have a choice, if we are very knowledgeable in the space, you have a choice to work for an exchanges or work for this NGO or lobby group, uh, you know, might be a tough decision for uh, some, a lot of people actually. Hmm. Yeah. And similar type of issues, uh, you know, I, I see similar types of issues in Japan as well. A lot of good developers and good people actually work for exchanges because they are the best funded. They have, they have most money, right? Uh, yeah, it's capitalism. I mean, yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> so uh, that, that's the other thing. Since exchanges are most the, not the only entities, but they are the ones who have most money basically in Japan. Uh, other projects don't, didn't really grow. Uh, it's mostly about trading and exchanges. And nowadays we have a, a little bit more diverse projects in Japan, but until like 2018 or something, it was all, all exchanges. Not many people are working on any other projects, period. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's very, that's very different than Korea because we we have like it's not just exchanges or at least the exchanges are suffering right now. We could talk about Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Oh, so my question is, so what's hap what's happening with NFTs like in, from a regulation standpoint in Japan? Because I know a lot of the stuff that's oh, happening. Right. You guys are also with games, right? But it's like, right, right, what's right. the difference between NFT as opposed to like crypt cryptocurrency? Yeah. yeah, that's a very interesting question. And NFT is kind of an exception right now because it's not really a coin right it's more like a collectible so the fsa the regulator is making an exception for nft at the moment so if you are doing an nft game you can sell nft game items to users kind of like ico so right now it's okay uh but i i think once some you know bad guys start taking advantage of the situation, maybe they have to ban that as well. Because you, you can do practically an ICO using NFT as well, right? So. Yeah, yeah. And I think, I think, I think it'd be very interesting to watch the NFT space because the ICO market is pretty dead. So I think, be, I think it won't, uh, if people will start doing as like a ICO or fundraising by selling NFT tokens right. uh, in the space this year. So no. Uh, I mean, yeah, there's actually one famous uh, NFT game in Japan now called My Crypto Heroes. And it's actually one of the most used crypto game right now on the Ethereum network. They have the most users, more active users, more than CryptoKitties and others. So, oh, that's awesome. Yeah, that, that's very popular. And seeing the success of the, that game, I, I'm, I know there are some other people working on NFT games now as well in Japan. Yo, know, like we we had we had a game in um, Korea, like I think a couple of days back, it was it eclipsed CryptoKitty in ter terms of usage on Dap Radar and stuff. I forget mm -hmm. the name of it, um, but yeah, I mean that and then EOS. There's like EOS Knights and all the EOS games that are coming out that are doing pretty good. But that's that's cool. It's cool to hear that like NFT activity is really high in Japan. What uh, do you guys? Yeah, it's a trend. What do you guys think about Tron-based uh, games? Uh... I mean, it's, it's the same as EOS to me. Uh, to me, EOS and Tron are very similar in terms of technology and architecture. So it's, a, it's faster than Ethereum and cheaper than Ethereum. And it kind of makes sense from a you know, game developer perspective because it's very difficult to build games on Ethereum now because of fee and speed. And scalability. I think, I think with Loom and the other off-chain scaling solution, uh, things might improve for Ethereum. But I think so far, I think uh, Tron-based games are pretty interesting because uh, I've been playing around. I, I think one of the most user-friendly um, uh, blockchain to use. Uh, they have this MetaMask equivalent on Tron and you can click and then you start playing and it's really fast okay. and quick. Uh, but I think for EOS, it's harder. Like, I don't see an uh, equivalent uh, browser plug-in and all that you can use it and then you need to have EOS before you can open a car and then you have to buy CPU, RAM and it just makes it a bit a bit of a confusion I would say. Yeah so here in, here in lies I guess my question so is the is the Tron is the response time on Tron is the, all that stuff good because there isn't enough dApps on Tron yet like so we have all these projects that are like we don't know what their maximum capacity is we mm -hmm. we figured out what ethereum's maximum capacity is because of traffic congestion right. because you do crypto kitties and 
BAT ICO and um, like status ICO and stuff. But like everything else has, has, have they, do you guys think, or Bobby, I guess you know best, like from the data, like do, does traffic on this, on these other blockchain, have they been stress tested enough? <laughs> I think, I think for EOS and Tron, I mean, they're using delegated proof of stake, so they can definitely handle a lot more transactions than Ethereum. Um, mm. That's for sure for the time being. I think for Ethereum, the only way to scale this uh, debt-based games would be to use off-chain solutions. So I think it'll be very interesting to see how Loom develops. I think a lot of these uh, NFT games, they are, trying, they are trying to use Loom and other off-chain solu uh, off off solutions. Uh, but for the time being, I would say uh, EOS and Tron, uh, but that, that then comes the, the, the dilemma, right? So because EOS and Tron can handle a lot of transactions and because these transactions are actually pretty cheap to put on, so whatever numbers that you see on Debt Radar on the daily active users and all makes you question if there's actually real users or it's actually done by bots as well. Mm -hmm. So, so I, think, I think what EOS and Tron need, honestly, is uh, they need a stable coin. They have so much gambling apps on there. <laughs> That I'm like, why don't they have a stable coin? Why, why would I want to gamble on top of EOS or on top of Tron? So like this double the volatility. But like if, at least if there's a stable coin, like one-to-one -one pegged EOS to dollar stable coin or like Tron to a dollar stable coin, then that'll be fine. Because YOLO, right? YOLO. <laughs> you only live once. You gamble and you gamble all out. <laughs> Holy shit. Okay, I get it. Yeah. Yeah. But I, but I agree with you on a stablecoin point. I think, I think uh, this year we'll see a lot of growth in stablecoins. Um, and uh, it's not just stablecoins on, on uh, Ethereum. We'll see stablecoins moving on to the EOS and Tron blockchain. I think Tether recently announced that they moved some of the coins on, they issued some of the coins on Tron blockchain as well, I think. Oh, did they really? I think I remember reading about it. Uh, wow. I, w I wonder where they're storing all their money. <laughs> what banks? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then they and made this announcement recently as well, where instead of uh, each tether being back one to one with US dollar, it changed on a website to uh, cash equivalent, and it include loans to other affiliate companies as well. So that's actually a big, pretty big change in the definition of uh, tether. Hey, but honestly, we knew we knew they were doing that all along. It's just yeah. that now they changed the wording so that it reflects what they were actually doing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess they start being more honest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so, I guess, uh, I guess a question I have um, uh, about, about you, Bobby, is like, what's, what's going on in Malaysia? Like, what's, what's up? So, I think, I, think, I think it's pretty interesting. So, in Malaysia, the government has started to regulate things. So, um, first of all, they start to regulate the number of exchanges and they are in the process of drafting regulations and they, uh, find, they have shortlisted a number of exchanges that will be regulated and then in the I think in the next couple of months or so, they have finalized a list of exchanges that will be regulated. Uh, I think at one point they had like 40 over exchanges, a lot of them with small trading volume, but now they've shortlisted it to 22 and then I think they've cut it down further. Uh, and also for ICO, they, have, uh, they are now in the process of drafting regulations to 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 decide what is good and what what can be done or cannot be done i mean they have pretty much said that uh, all icos are securities in malaysia so pretty pretty similar to japan i guess this is to some extent good for the market uh, because otherwise there will be a lot of scams so the now the government is actually the securities commission of malaysia is actually uh, seeking some feedback from the market from the industry participants on what the market thinks that sh how it should be regulated. So that's pretty much the process at this point in time. Um, I guess it's good for the industry that exchanges are getting regulated. A lot of the exchanges couldn't really get a bank account, but if they get regulated and they have a license from the Securities Commission, I guess to some extent, it means they are legit. They have been vetted by the government and they sh probably can get a bank account. Uh, before that, it was pretty hard to, to open a bank account. It's, pretty hard to, to, to buy Bitcoin from an exchange. A lot of people were relying on a peer-to-peer -peer marketplace like local Bitcoins and Rami mm. Tano. But once yeah. this is regulated, you can buy it from a centralized exchange, probably easier after this. So that's interest. That's, that's the point of view. Exchanges are getting regulated. ICOs are getting regulated as well over here. Okay. 
Yeah, I remember when I visited Malaysia and met you guys, CoinGecko team. Uh, you guys are mentioning, oh, there are like so many scams nowadays, and <laughs> and that's pretty bad, right? So, yeah. Um, I guess it's good for the market. I mean, I guess it's the same for Japan. Like the regulators only, the regulators want to take care of their domestic users, right? Like they don't want their local population to get scammed. And, right. and so they are trying to do all out to make sure things are done properly. They are, these guys, I mean, one of the requirements is to have a, a, share, a high share capital so that these guys have the money to back things up in case anything goes wrong. So those kind of things, the government want to have investor protection at, at one of right. the yeah. high priority, right? Yeah, yeah, and that, that always makes sense. And that's why, I, although I'm not a big fan of Japanese regulation, I try not to blame it on the regulator too much yeah. because they had to do their job. And the situation was kind of bad in Japan as well. I mean, at the end of the day, there are not that many people who are that educated. Most people are just using it to trade and they're not right. too, they can't tell what is legit and what is not legit. So to some extent, getting things cleaned up and regulated is like, okay, these are the things that have been vetted by the government and it's like sort of okay. And like everything else is like at your own risk. Right. All right, sounds good. Uh, any other questions? We actually covered a lot of topics that we we're not planning on, which is good, but <laughs> we still have a lot of things we can talk about if we want to, but, um, but you know, since it's been about an hour already, so we can try to wrap it up. Yeah. Any, any other last questions or anything? I just, I, yeah, I mean, it'll be more, uh, I mean, we could talk about it after after the recording. <laughs> It'll be like more of like how we get other people involved, right? Sure. Um, yeah. yeah, but I think this type of uh, show that talks about what's happening in respective country, because there's a lot of misconceptions about Japan and probably I misunderstand a lot of things in Korea, for example, right? So it could be valuable. So if possible, I would like to continue this and invite different guests, people from, I don't know, China, Hong Kong, many others, right? Yep, yep, so, yeah. pretty fun, right? Yeah, yeah, just a, just a fun show. <laughs> just <laughs> talk, yeah. Cool. Awesome. Okay. All right, so I guess that's it for this one. Yeah, yep. okay, everyone, thank you for, thank yep. you for tuning in. Thank you. <laughs> All right, thank you. Ho hopefully I'll talk to you guys again and do another one. All right, All right. bye.